Well, hey, everyone. My name is AJ. I'm thank you for being with me here live. Uh, I am AJ Reed with um, the, the Only Green Party as a co-chair. I'm also the former co-chair for the Green Party of the United States um, and also serve in other capacities in other organizations, whether it's the Quad Cities, uh, DSA. Um, I have worked with a, a number of other organizations, which I, I get to later on and everything. And for the purposes of this evening, um, we're going to be talking about something that I talked about at this past uh, annual national meeting uh, with the Green Party, where the theme was about um, anti-oppression. And then that workshop I did was called um, Radical Pedagogy as Praxis and how to some, uh, and pretty much what it comes down to is how to use political education um, as a way to conduct our practice as organizers and activists um, at the end of the day. And so I'm going to be talking about some of those um, teaching models and how you can implement that <clears throat> through your political education and how it also may be applied to organizing as well. Uh, I will be looking at the uh, chat section to uh, see um, if any questions you may have and everything. Um, I'm seeing there's folks right here. I'm glad you're joining, uh, joining us this evening and everything. Um, so without um, I'll further ado, um, um, if we can get the slideshow up here in a moment. So like I said, this, um, this is about radical pedagogy as practice, praxis. And if we can go to the next slide. So uh, the one thing about education that I really like about is that this idea um, that true education is the knowledge of oneself and that the development of our talent and full potential. So essentially, this is a, uh, a decolonial framework about education. And we'll get into later on, like, why we're breaking away from this conventional idea of education that we all know and love, that we all have experienced in our public, if not private, um, uh, education experiences, um, whether it's K through 12, as well as in higher education. So uh, when it comes to education, it's really about building our own knowledge. And then from that knowledge that we create our talents and the fullest potential possible that we can do in order to move forward and to advance uh, the very things that we need to get done in order to make another world possible. Uh, next slide. So if you can see on the screen, um, just a little bit of biography, I'm not going to get down to details of it, but I, I am an activist for over 20 years, uh, as well as an organizer where my work um, intersects between racial justice, housing rights, uh, queer, queer and trans liberation, uh, economic democracy, and environmental justice. Uh, for the purposes of this workshop, uh, I, am, I am an educator, um, both in uh, secondary and higher education levels um and as well as a community organizer where i work through various free schools uh community teach-ins um event workshops um and i've been doing that like since 2000 so again within that 20 years and everything so I like myself as an educator really um meshes my work as an activist and an organizer and as the scholar um i, I do I do have degrees uh um, my academic interests lie within social sciences, you know, uh, uh, the philosophy, uh, e economics, things of that nature, as well as the humanities, religious studies, the arts. Um, and I am trained as an interdisciplinary researcher, um, utilizing those two fields as well as like business and everything. Um, so, again, I won't get the nitty gritty, but this is who I am. So I am talking right now as AJ, the activist scholar, and we'll talk about what that means here in a second. So next slide. So this is a little bit of an outline. Um, in a moment, I'm going to talk about the concepts and frameworks when it, when it comes to radical pedagogy. Um, and then certain models um, y'all can use um, in your own political education programs and things to think about 
as activists and organizers when conducting yourselves as community organize or community educators yourselves. Um, so I'm going to try to weave as much as possible what those models are and then how to implement uh, those models into your political education and everything. Uh, next slide. So this is we're going to slow down for a bit. So when we talk about radical pedagogy as practice, praxis, if we really break it down into individual parts, when we talk about being radical, we're talking about believing and expressing the belief that there should be social or political change. So pretty much trying to make change from its roots, you know, trying to pull things out from its roots and then plant something new that's going to be changing our society and our planet through the various systems that we have currently and everything. So when we talk about pedagogy, this bougie term, pedagogy, if it were, uh, it's essentially the study of methods and activity is teaching. That's what pedagogy means. So um, for those of you who are educators, um, you fully well know what pedagogy means. But for those who may not know, there are many, many models of teaching people, um, not just elementary level and secondary level and higher education levels, um, but even through community education as well. There, there's different ways to teach. It's not just what you have seen through uh, the educator that you've experienced and everything. And you may know an educator that's like, oh, I liked what how they taught me. And that's how I learned best, you know. So you may have learned from someone because of that particular um, pedagogical approach, model, if it were, of how they prevent, um, excuse me, they presented that information to you. And again, practice, we're talking about the process of using theories or something that you have learned in a very practical way. So those ideas and we, those ideas that we have learned, whether we're socialists, communists, anarchists, and then taking those ideas and turning them into action, that kind of praxis. So if we put those all together, we're talking about radical, we're talking about radical pedagogy as a way of thinking about and negotiating through praxis. And we're trying to understand that relationship between the classroom um, in that classroom or in the public, um, in that production of knowledge and thinking about larger institutional structures and how we can think about new ideas in a very radical way and understand that these institutions that are out there who are still having us in chains and trying to break away from those in the name of social justice, economic justice, and environmental justice. So we have to really be thinking about that relationship between educators and the learners, and then how we're going to really dismantle institutions um, through education. Because any organizer, if any time you go into organizing, you know, there's a formula for it, you know, agitation, organ organizing, and there's that other element called educate, right? So we really need that education piece in order to advance the necessary things we need to be doing. Next slide. So this is really like for, uh, your purpose is to understand where I'm coming from. So these next two slides, it's pretty much uh, y'all seeing what's in AJ's head, you know, in terms of a framework. Um, so through my pedagogical practice, practice um, these are just some of the names. This is a, a short list of a longer list of folks that I implement as much as possible. Um, and, and first and foremost is Paula Ferrer. Um, wrote the book, Pedagogy of the Press. If you haven't read it, check it out. Um, you, there's PDF files online. You, you can get this and read it on your own leisure. Um, this is pretty much one of the foundational works when it comes to radical pedagogy. Um, 
and, and Paulo Ferrer's thing is that, you know, education is never neutral. You know, education's about advancing radical ideas, you know, and we need to break away from that banking model. When he says banking model, it's that thing that we have, we've all experienced. And in, in some ways, I'm kind of doing it with you right now, unfortunately, which is uh, you hear something and you bank in your head and you deposit that. And then at some point, you're going to output that out at some point. So that's what Ferrer is saying. We have to break away from that banking model and be among people and to show them the interconnectedness of things that are happening in our society, which made him very successful um, in, in Brazil at the time um, and has trained so many educators that are still with us today. And those educators have trained many of us currently. One of those people we've trained was Bell Hooks. Um, Bell Hooks, um, her thing is using the classroom um, as a transformative space. You know, uh, she really is about, you know, using that classroom as a way to transform learners into the kind of people we would like to see um, in, in our society and everything. So she really uses the, the classroom as a laboratory. And I even talk about that myself when I'm in in high schools. <clears throat> is that, you know, this is a laboratory, you know, uh, and we were trying to transform as much as possible. One of the books that you need to be reading with Bell Hooks is Teaching to Transgress. That's a, a, one of her great books that I would recommend. Edward Said, again, he's the pioneer of what we can now consider post-colonial studies. And uh, his ideas about functioning and non-functioning intellectuals. The summary of that is that everyone's an intellectual, um, and and it's it's th that idea that we need to break away. That those who are more educated, you know, the ones with the PhDs, the one at Harvard or with the ivory towers, like those are intellectuals. No, every single one of us are intellectuals. You know, the trade worker is an intellectual. The person in the streets is the intellectual. Uh, myself, who is both formally and self-taught, educated, you know, is an intellectual. You know, every single one of us is an intellectual at some level. And coming together to work together will make us a better society. Um, Sonia Borges uh, recently have been introduced by her um, is a really great person. Her ideas about militant education and essentially it's about living among among the people before the people and behind the people and that that's the thing about militant education that when we're talking about education we have to be with people at their level not talking down to them we have to be with them we have to understand how to transform them as well M michael apple a uh, professor at uw uh, excuse me, University of Wisconsin Madison, and uh, he has a, an article called um, "Ideology and Curriculum," where he talks about uh, school controls uh, controls the meaning meaning to reinforce the current hegemonic culture. And it, in other words, Apple really says that it's the institution known as education controls the narrative. And if we understand that then we need to break away from that. And then oh, I'm going to be talking about a little bit later how we can break away from that. So if we understand that the institution of education controls the narrative as to what you need to know, and that's how we learn. And we're start, we, we, and we see this today with, you know, what's going on with the pandemic and with critical race theory and everything else, um, then we, we really need to understand that if we start breaking away from what the hegemonic culture has been teaching us since kindergarten, then the more we will start advancing ourselves and start really thinking very critically being open to more ideas and really ha engaging in the kind of conversation we need to be having and everything. Uh, and, and Leah Vygotsky, 
is a social constructivist theory, theorist um, who believes of um, having learners socially interact with one another as collaborators um, to gain that kind of knowledge. Um, so again, this is just a short list of many folks that I um, use in my toolbox uh, when it comes to education. Um, the next slide. So, the, again, the, the continuation of this framework, again, you know, as this is, again, part of my framework. Um, Y'all can use this yourselves, and i uh, be more than happy to talk to any one of you at some point also. Um, again, this, I, I, as someone who's an activist scholar, and what I mean by that is I'm bridging ideas between scholarship and activists and organizing together. That's pretty much for me, that's what activist scholarship is about, you know, how to use the tools I've I've been learning, you know, and then take it out into the streets to understand the issues, as well as to how to present that information to folks to help them understand what those issues are, as well as collaborate with others on how to advance the kind of real reforms that we need to be doing. And, th and so through that, I do things what's called um, critical ethnography or militant ethnography. It's pretty much exploring people or groups, lived experiences. Um, I use a decolonial approach, um, again, it's trying to break away from this monolithic monoculture that's presented to us and stripping that down and saying, no, I mean, we, we have to understand other folks to create a counter narrative that essentially a, uh, a white, cis, hetero uh, system has been presenting to us since we all can remember. Um, Panche B, Panche Bay, um, Panche Bay is essentially seeking the root of truth. Um, and, and then that's something I have, I've learned um, very recently myself. And I've kind of implemented that in my own teachings now of... Um, and I've kind of been doing that, but I didn't know what the word was, and that word is on um, Panche Bay. So I kind of use that right here um, to seek the truth that needs to be sought out. Um, critical race theory. I think all of us have uh, understand what that is to the day, since that's the current topic of today. But if you don't know, um, critical race theory or CRT is a uh, Stripping away, uh, you know, that social life, the political structures, and the economic systems that are founded upon race. Um, and we're, we're trying to be very critical of uh, the, the, the the powers that have been happening um, to us. And then insert that kind of critical race theory in there to understand, like, well, why this is happening in, in our society and everything. And then feminist pedagogy um, is... Understanding that uh, we live in a patriarchal, transphobic society, um, and then trying to find the, that intersectionality between those two things. And then queer pedagogy is challenging this cis heterosexual normative structures as well. Um, so, again, this is just my framework, um, part of my framework. Um, but so, this is what. I'm presenting to you and hopefully I introduce you to some names you never heard of um, and so, as well as some certain ideas you never heard of as well. Um, and hopefully if I know some of y'all, reach out to me. I'd be more than happy to expand on all of these individually. Um, if not, do another workshop, maybe just focusing on some of these things as well. But now let's talk about some of the models that we can be using um, in our practice and everything. Uh, so one, one, one of those things is um, indigenous-based pedagogies, which is a, a decolonial approach that emphasizes the knowledge that comes from the community, is listening to what the community needs, along with the ways to transform community members who have been learning from oppressive institutions. So there's, there's going to be two models I'm going to be introducing to y'all. Um, 
with indigenous based pedagogies, you know, this comes from a place of, of ethnic studies, critic, um, excuse me, cultural studies. Um, so uh, you could always look into uh, Chicano studies. There's a lot of literature on that, uh, on this particular topic, um, as well as, you know, First Nations um, pedagogies up in Canada has curriculums on these as well. Um, and I'm, towards the end, there's going to be a resource list, a, a, short, a very short list that will introduce some of those things that you would like to know more. Um, so one of those um, pedagogies, if we go to the next slide, is uh, what's called um, Barrio Pedagogy. Um, so this is really a Ferrarian model uh, that creates classroom as a convergence um, between the barrio and the institution. And for those of you who have probably seen this, um, Democracy Now! did a, a lot about this during the 90s, late 90s, um, and in Arizona, in Tucson, Arizona specifically, um, the Tucson School District was told that they could not do um, what was considered Mexican American studies in the classroom. And it was a big battle between that. And then at the end of the day, Arizona said no more um, ethnic studies or Mexican American studies. Um, and that started springing up a lot of school districts who kind of did the same thing. So a lot of the educators in Tucson um, and also in parts of um, Southern California um, really inserted this idea. It was co considered um, barrio education, this idea that we have to meet students that have been left out of the conversation. They have been left out of curriculum. And so the one thing an idea in, in, in pedagogy you should understand is this idea called um, um, mirrors and windows. This idea called mirrors and windows. Um, Emily Stiles came up with this idea. And the idea if when you write curriculum that there's mirrors and windows and you have a mirror is that reflects the curriculum that, that you can represent, that represents you. So in this case, when you have, or you, when you're not teaching about uh, histories from uh, Mexico or any parts of Latin America, if you like take that out, or at least shortchange um, things that come from Latin America, whether it's just history, the politics, um, everything that's related to that, if you just take that out, then you're taking a whole narrative out, and you're just inserting what you think. The learners should be learning everything. And then the window is for those who need to know, looking out that window to see, hey, this is what is going on out there. And this is essentially what Barrio Pedagogy is about, is essentially developing those counter narratives to challenge what the current culture that we have is saying. It's like, no, let's look at the border. The border is not what the media has been telling us. The border is not what our current political structures telling us the border is listening to the families that are leaving because the government is invading parts of South America and Central America. So they're coming here for that. The border is the person seeking asylum to come here because uh, the nation that they are in are going to threaten them because they, they may be queer or they're trans or they don't like what's going on in that nation, so they're seeking political asylum here, but they don't teach you that. So this is where we're talking about is understanding the student's voice right there and listening to them and help transform uh, the, that narrative and help transform what they've been taught up to that point. If we go to the next slide. So part of this barrio education is a uh, Tahui. Uh, Tahui essentially the, the pedagogy and practice is this larger piece that's really talking about um, cr teaching critical consciousness, that interconnectedness through student-centered learning 
ha providing agency through critical praxis, that historical literacy development, unity through community and intersectional identity development. Um, uh, Tahui is that and trying to implement all that in order to develop a curriculum that's a Nahui Olin. And that curriculum um, is about self-reflection, self the will to act, providing that knowledge and that transformation and everything. And, and I have a lot of articles about that. I, I won't get into much detail over it. Again, I might do another um, workshop just on that alone, if not invite a friend of mine who will, who will probably speak a lot better than I about this and everything. But this is when we talk about this, let's think about this as organizers, as community educators, you know, we, we can utilize these things that, no, we don't have a classroom, but we are meeting virtually for sure. But if we are meeting in person, whether it's in a park or in the library, at the cafe, wherever we're at, let's really think about how, how are we teaching critical consciousness to our members? How are we teaching critical consciousness to the public? Um, how are we connecting? What's that interconnectedness um, between the community member center learning at this point? You know, what's the agency? You know, what kind of historical literacy development are we providing? And how are we building that unity through community um, as well as that intersectional development? as well. So we need to be thinking about these things um, through our own political education programs when we're talking about these kind of things. And then really start talking about that self-reflection piece and then that will to act and that providing that knowledge and transformation. So again, when we talk about this model, it's really trying to converge where people are at and then, and then and the institutions that are out there and in those in those institutions that developed a certain narrative and how are we advancing those counter narratives that have been excluded that not just in this case um mexican-american uh the experience but what's that inter sectionality when it comes to uh, race, ethnicity, sexuality, gender, so forth and so forth. So how are we doing that as organi organizers and activists through political education in that way? If we go to the next slide. So this is another model. It's an Aboriginal model down in Australia. It's called the eight ways of learning. And if you kind of see this, this circle up here, um, that circle really displays that interconnectedness, right? Um, so the idea, this Aboriginal idea, is showing that there are eight different ways of learning. There's not one way of learning, you know, and, 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 as, and as educators, we know this. Um, then that be carried out in practice with some educators, but in, as educators, we know this. We know people... Um, are not just visual learners, but there's auditory learners, um, learners who uses um, movements, athletic, athletics, things of that nature. And so this eight way of learning is really trying to interconnect, not just two things, but as much of these eight ways as possible. So it's about sharing stories. So it's listening to the other person about their story. It's about understanding who that person is. You know, for all of us, you know, we, we meet people, but we don't know them fully, right? So I remember this at um, Occupy meetings at the General Assembly, and, and I knew people. But after I get to list, I actually fully listen to them, understand who they are, where they lived. I understood them better. It's like, oh, okay, I get it. I see where you're at. I understand why you feel this way. I understand where you're coming from now. And I get, and I can know them in that sense. Um, so if we share those kind of stories, that will help provide a little bit better picture for us. 
um, and showing pictures. You know, there, there's something that's lost sometimes about using imagery and art and everything about understanding things. So if we show pictures, um, as pass away the knowledge, um, then we, we can utilize that visual piece to also understand things. You know, how do these things work? You know, if we're talking about ho housing rights, you know, let's show a map of where people are at as well as, you know, the housing situation, you know, or food deserts, you know, here's where the food deserts are at. So let's, let's show it. Let's show people about that. Um, and again, the nonverbal, you know, um, we see, we think, we act, we make things without words, you know, and this is another creative way, you know, of maybe, maybe doing zines or doing an art piece, a performance piece, you know, music. Um, we can do things without having words because sometimes we don't have the words to express the things we want to do, you know, and so there's, there's times that we need to be doing that. Um, and that goes with the symbols, symbols and images and everything, you know, land, land, link, land linking is important in this piece. And we don't do this a lot also is taking people out of a certain space and just learning about our local ecosystems as well as the land around us. So if we think about it, you know, what if, if we, again, if we're talking about food deserts, you know, how about at the next meeting, let's just go to an area and then start walking where these food deserts are at and see it. It's one thing to say it. It's one thing to intellectualize it. It's one thing to see on a map, create a map, it's one thing to do that, but actually see it and visibly see homes and saying, okay, so let's talk about this now. Let's talk about how far these people have to go. You know, let's now listen to what's happening and everything. And then with all these ideas, you know, thinking is not all linear. It's all this nonlinear thing. So taking all these nonlinear ideas and then pull them together and piece them together to figure out how that is becoming our knowledge because that's how knowledge actually works is this non-linear way of thinking um and we and try to work from certain parts that we are watching and doing and everything and then how does this all work within the community and everything so with all these eight ways we can connect as you can see in the circle we can connect connect them in so many ways and it doesn't have to be just one way. It could be multiple ways, you know, may work one day, next way, maybe a whole different thing. That's the beauty about this pedagogical model is we can really do things um, in a very deconstructed way to provide uh, knowledge. The next slide. So this has kind of been I wouldn't say in the last decade, maybe. It's kind of been on the forefront a little bit in the last decade. Um, this idea called um, Anarchist Pedagogy. This is another book. Um, Anarchist Pedagogies by um, Robert Haworth here. Um, and what, what, what Robert does is he kind of goes in and talks about different ways, um, different anarchist schools, um, de-schooling. Um, it goes a little bit about different programs, like when the industrial workers of the world had a workers people's college. Um, uh, I think he goes a little bit into like the anarchist free school and in Spain, a little bit, Mark Bray, um, did a book on that as well. Um, so check Mark's book out about that. Um, but again, so this is like kind of this, this new idea has been coming up. Um, it's Robert um, Haworth, um, H A W O R T H, and now his name will be at the end of the presentation as well on the resource list. And so, this idea of this anarchist pedagogy is using anarchist philosophy of equality, justice, solidarity, freedom, and nonviolence, culture, and importantly, happiness. Um, while the participant and the educator work together on the, on the same goal. So 
it, it is kind of going off a little bit of barrio pedagogy, just a little bit. I mean, I mean the, at least the theme of it, you know, um, and you know, education theorists like um, Lid Vygotsky has talked about this. Um, John Dewey also has mentioned this a little bit. Um, Sonia Borges talks about it in her book about um, uh, Guinea Bissau um, during the 70s um, when they were doing all this this, this liberation down there um, in, in uh, Guinea Bissau and um, how it's about, again, living among people before people behind people, that idea. Um, this is kind of where anarchist pedagogy settles at, you know, without using those names um, and these kind of texts that I'm just mentioning. Um, and and some people have done this a little bit without calling them anarchist pedagogy. Um, so like there's like a, a social justice center up in Madison, Wisconsin. They have a, a free school up there. Um, they kind of implement a anarchist pedagogy um, where they talk about, you know, talking about justice um, and solidarity and freedom and everything. And so they talk about all these ideas in a very um, organic way. Um, the Black Panthers, um, through their um, free school program, is a, uh, I'm sure some of the Black Panthers will disagree with me on this a little bit, but I, I would I would say, I would argue that they kind of use an anarchist um, model, you know, this idea of like de-schooling and bringing uh, kids and adults into the communities, into the neighborhoods and teaching them for free as part of their 10 point program. Um, so they kind of implemented this a little bit. Uh, even in, in the Occupy movement with our um, teach-ins is a little bit of an anarchist pedagogy. And there's this one image on, if you're looking at it from your end, you know, on the upper left-hand corner is uh, uh, the Ella Baker Freedom School um, that I was um, honored enough to help um, get off the ground in, in the south side of Chicago. Um, w without even saying it, we, we didn't use anarchist pedagogy, but we kind of did that, you know, and, all the youth there as, and us, we were learning from each other. We were learning from the kids what their needs are, and they were teaching us things, and we were teaching them things also. So it was kind of like that collaboration that was happening. That was very student-centered as well. Um, and we had a lot of youth from the south and west side of Chicago. So they were bringing in um, narratives and experiences that I never thought of or heard of before. And so they were teaching me a lot. Um, so th I mean, this is where anarchist pedagogy is. You know, it's, it's really about collaboration and this relationship between the learner and the educator. And, and if you develop a, a study, uh, a study group, that's part of the idea of a study group, right? Is we're all learning from the same text or video or whatever your study group is about or reading group or discussion group. And you're learning from that person's understanding of that idea. And you're learning from one another. It's not someone telling you, oh, this is what uh, this person, this author is saying, blah, blah, blah. It's really, it's, it's really about collaboration. Uh, next slide. Punk pedagogy. This is also a fairly new idea. I was saying, I was saying the last five years. Um, one book that came out is this one called um, Punkademics. Um, this was edited by um, Zach Furness, and, and his name will be at the end of this presentation as well. Um, so you can see that. Um, and so the idea of punk pedagogy Again, the same theme of barrio pedagogy as well as um, anarchist pedagogy is this manifestation about equity, collaboration, community, love, critique, self-examination, rebellion, all the things that are ha happening in, in the punk scene while using the do-it-yourself DIY ethos of punk culture. Um, and these two examples here, um, 
upper right hand corner is a space called what was known as um black sheep cafe in springfield illinois um it's, it's one of my favorite places it was an all ages venue and not only they had like good music out of there but you would have the you know the the philosopher who would come by and teach everyone about you know this idea about revolt and um engage in conversation as to what does revolt look like and thinking and using the idea of a revolt as a way of thinking or whatever um else they present present to you um it's also been a space where people just come and hang out and collaborate as well um the other image opposite of that is a space in um new york called um abc no rio again it's, it's not only a venue but it's an inf info shop it's a zine library um they have a free computer space there's a free print mate um screen prints yeah screen printing there as well <clears throat> so it's, it's again it's another space it's a community space where people come there and hang out as well as you know talk about what needs to be happening in the communities in that neighborhood of new york as well as the greater part of new york and this was also the space of occupy um new york uh, occupy wall street folks were going there and doing teachings and everything and so this idea of punk pedagogy is uh from from our for our take as organizers you know how can we use the space in a very punk way if it were you know um how how are we implementing the kind of equity and collaboration in love and community that we are presenting doing our political education programs are we critiquing others in a very constructive way and not just cutting them down um are we self-examining ourselves? That's an important piece in education, right? We have to self-examine ourselves um, and then, and in order to grow our own knowledge in order to develop, develop the kind of wisdom that we need to be doing. Um, and then, yeah, do it yourself. Um, we have to do things ourselves, right? Because we don't have the tools necessary in order to present these ideas so some of us do in this pandemic period right now are using a lot more open source information and having all these kind of things at our disposal because we can't afford the microsoft's and other things possible and everything we have to sometimes hey i have a zoom y'all can't we, I know y'all can't afford it, but you can use my Zoom for your needs. You know, I, I can't be at the meeting, but you can still use it and everything. So, again, it's about that community, and it's about trying to do it ourselves as much as possible. And I love this kind of pedagogy um, as a punk myself. Um, I just gravitate towards that. And, again, this is something I, I never um, thought about. And I kind of, you know, how can I implement my... Um, punkness my punk culture i've already you know instilled with me into the classroom and here it is it's, it's, it's in a book next slide please so this is fairly new this is a fairly new idea hip-hop pedagogy <coughs> um for those who may know this image here is um krs1 um, one of my favorite hip hop artists, um, K KRS one. Um, so hip hop pedagogy is this approach about teaching and learning, teaching and learning to allow students, um, to make connections between their culture and content that caters to all learners of multiple intelligences. Um, the, just like punk, but like punk, but a little bit different. Hip hop culture is really about understanding um, where, where you are from. So we have so when we talk about hip hop, you know, for me, hip hop is starting um, in the Bronx, and the folks like Grandmaster Flash and Africa Mabonita and. You know, all those guys and women 
there who introduced this music idea, but not just music. There was even art, visual art also. Um, graffiti also kind of came out of hip hop as well. And it's, it's really about bridging that culture, you know, and this is how we're trying to connect learners and everything. And so this idea of hip hop pedagogy, um, if we go to the next slide. So these are the different elements of hip hop pedagogy. So if we understand ourselves as the educator in a very hip hop way, in the upper left hand corner with the person with the mic, you know, like we're the MCs, the, the MCs job is to understand the audience. That's the MC's job is to understand and really get the vibes from the audience on what's going on. And they're the ones who are laying down the beat and making sure that everything is going very, very, very fast, very, very fast, or maybe going as slow to make sure we are doing something. Right. This is the MC's job is to understand uh, really um, vocalizing the things that we need to be doing and everything. Just below that with the spray can, art is very important. So we, again, the way we learn is about understanding um, how we can express things through art. So through political education, again, what's have an art night, have people draw, bring a paint set and have people paint at a very abstract way or, or a very realist way um bring spray cans out and spray paint um skateboard decks or uh, jeans um that you, you don't want anymore is spray paint and jeans to make designs or something or paint jeans or something um those are the kind of things we need to be doing the, the next image to that with um wow i'm losing words <laughs> the record um Music, implement music and everything. Um, music is also important to do things. So if you're talking about educators in the classroom, you know, when you have students doing something, put music on, you know, something upbeat, something inspirational. Um, it, it, it can be lo-fi hip hop. You can introduce hip hop. You can introduce punk, you can introduce rock, you can introduce something that I would say in the context of what you're doing. So even, you know, when you're DJing also like that, you know, it's also the DJ's job not only to ins insert the kind of music, you know, but, you know, provide those kind of beats for the kind of things that are happening and everything. So maybe it's a very slow day and you're at the meeting and you want to do political education, but everyone's like, oh, I don't want to be here again. If you're the D if you're DJing, you know, put some upbeat music in there to get people going and everything. Um, break dancing and hip hop, you know, in this, in this context, you know, some sort of movement, you know, it doesn't have to be break dancing, but some sort of movement. Um, sh sh uh, go out, take a walk or maybe do some exercising or do something artistically. If you have someone who can, can, kind of facilitate something about, you know, show me justice, you know, be a human sculpture and show me what justice looks like to you. Um, that's one way of doing it. And then the, the, the final piece at the very top is um, self-actualizing, if it were, but again, self-reflection of identify, you know, this is, this is my identity. This is who I am. And this is, this is the whole, the elements of hip hop pedagogy here. Um, so, yeah, like I said, this is a very new concept. Um, there's there's some folks out there on Twitter that um, I think they meet on Tuesday nights and they do um, tweet discussions about this. Um, you can also go on YouTube and type in hip hop pedagogy. Can't think of the gentleman's name off the top of my head, but he's one of the people who I kind of kicked it off with um, hip hop pedagogy. Um, and if we go to the last slide, 
this is the resource list. Um, again, there's some names that I mentioned before. Paula Ferrer, Bell Hooks, one person I didn't talk about, but y'all need to check out is um, Bill Ayers wrote this book, Teaching for Social Justice, but he taught other books or wrote other books um, because he is um, his research background is in education policy. And so um, I would really definitely check him out um, with with his stuff. Um, Sonia Borges, as I mentioned earlier, Edward Said, um, Roger Bruns, um, the damnedest radical. Um, I, I thought I had it here. Um, it's this book. Um, it's about Ben Reitman. Ben Reitman was uh, a physician in Chicago, and he left the profession to start what what, what it was called then a, a hobo college. Um, essentially, what he did was he created this public college where um, folks got degrees. Um, so he worked with the homeless. He worked with sex workers. He worked with a whole bunch of other folks, um, even opened, I think, a free clinic at the time also to provide um, – a certain level of medical care also for them. And so um, th this is another one to check out. He also dated um, Emma Goldman for a little, for a while. Um, they were partners for a long time off and on. Um, but um, yeah, this is another good book just to understand how to maybe insert the kind of things that Ben was doing at the time and inserting it into your own kind of, Political education. Um, Robert Hallworth, I was talking about, um, Zach Furness, um, uh, Zito Institute, X I T O, uh, Zito Institute down in Tucson, Arizona. All those educators I was talking about earlier about the Mexican American Studies program, they all developed this organization. Um, and they do workshops. Um, the things I was talking about, I just finished a workshop with them last month with them to further understand um, barrio pedagogy and how to implement it and everything. And then the hip hop pedagogy projects and then the eight ways learning and everything. So those are the resources. Um, I have a few, a few minutes to answer any questions if anyone's here to ask anything. Um, I'll be more happy to answer any questions to the best of my ability? So I'll take a few questions. Um, what was the author's name? Robert Watt. What? Um, it's uh, Hawthorne. H A W O R T H. Any other questions? Don't I don't see any questions, but for those who are with us, I, I thank you for um, being here with us. Um, oh, Jason, you're so kind. Um, I, I do have a Twitter. Um, I will. I will say I don't use it as much, but I'm hopefully going to be using it somewhat here soon. Um, and that's um, at all lowercase g o g e o from below. That's just one word. G o from below. Um, it's essentially my uh, activist scholar um, Twitter account um, for all things geography, social sciences, and humanities, and everything. So yeah, if um, you don't have uh, any more questions, um, yeah, um, if you see the chat, uh, don't miss some of the other discussions that are going to be coming up with um, Howie, um, with the live stream, um, 
on the 26th of this month, um, there will be a, a reading group, um, a Green Socialist reading group on Tyranny of the Structuralists. Myself and Garrett Wasserman will be um, facilitating that conversation. So uh, hopefully you will be more than happy. Hopefully you'll, if you enjoy this, hopefully you will enjoy that discussion as well. Uh, you can check out that and register for that discussion and everything. Uh, it's, it's a really good book if you really want to understand about um, why organization structure is important. Um, so please check that out. Uh, the 26th of this month, that's going to be at 8 p.m. Eastern time. So hopefully you can enjoy enjoy yourselves with that. Um, so yeah, if there's nothing else, everyone, thank you. There you go. Right. Ah, can't do it right. Right there. <laughs> This right here. 26th of this month, um, 8 p.m. Eastern. <laughs> Tyranny of the structure list. Um, so, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, to Vicky's question, are we going to be recording the conversation on the 26th? Um, that is the hope that we will be recording this for those who uh, may not attend. Um, and and that will be uploaded onto the Green Socialists Organizing Project uh, as well. So everyone can see that conversation. Any other questions, thoughts? Well, again, uh, I think I thank you again, everyone, for joining this evening. Um, it was very much appreciated, and uh, hopefully, you enjoyed this as much as I have. And I'll be looking forward to you at the the reading group on the twenty sixth, as well as future uh, live stream workshops and conversations we're going to be having. So thank you very much and see you all soon and keep on fighting the good fight.